Kurt Campbell. Kurt Campbell. Kurt Campbell is the CEO and founder of the Asia Group, a strategy and capital advisory group that is committed to philanthropy in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, Mr. Campbell previously served as the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs under President Barack Obama, where he is widely credited as being a key architect of the pivot to Asia for advancing a comprehensive U.S. strategy that took him to every corner of the Asian Pacific region. Secretary uh, Hillary Clinton awarded him the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award in 2013. Thank you very much, Mr. Campbell. We'll thank, you from you now. thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to members of the community for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I had the great honor, uh, great honor and privilege to serve with Wendy Sherman at the State Department and under uh, Secretary Clinton. I'd like to just make two broad points today, if I can, uh, and then I'm open for conversation or discussion. I, I think uh, we, as Democrats, have to recognize uh, clearly that trade and globalization has profoundly disrupted the middle class of the United States. And we as a nation have not done enough to prepare or protect our workers for 21st century opportunities and challenges. Now, I come from the foreign policy and national security community. And too often when we look at agreements and uh, initiatives like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, we say we have an imperative to lead. And we have to take these steps without understanding the profound impacts they have on American communities. And I think one of the things that we have to face squarely as Democrats uh, is that our nation has not done enough. And we've just heard this poignantly with respect to retraining initiatives that will keep American jobs and opportunities uh, in our country going forward. This is probably the most difficult challenge we face as a party going forward. And the challenges in a globalizing economy are deep and profound. Uh, this is balanced by another set of challenges that we face. Uh, now, I would propose that we as a nation have gone on a profound detour over the course of the last 20 years. Uh, the lion's share of the history, without question, in the 21st century is going to be written in Asia. And no one should have any questions about that. But you would never know it from the activities of our military and our senior strategic leaders in our focus on the Middle East. And we are involved in a profound contest in Asia. And the greatest challenge that we will face as a country from any nation that we've ever dealt with, the Soviet Union or Iraq, Afghanistan, you name it, will come from China. And that will be at every level. It will be militarily, but it will also be about setting the rules for how commerce, trade, and economic affairs will be regulated in the 21st century. So our challenge has to be, how do we arrive at agreements that help set the record for how business will be conducted? How can the United States lead in the world because we can't withdraw from it? How can we protect our workers? How can we support our businesses? But at the same time, recognize that the largest middle class in history is in Asia. How do we not export our jobs and our factories, but export our services and our goods from the United States to Asia in such a manner that uh, fits our strategic purpose? So I come here today as a member of the Foreign Policy National Security Committee, community, and I believe fundamentally that the United States has a responsibility to lead in Asia. I'm not going to get into the particulars of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but I simply want to lodge a view with this group that the United States must understand that we do not have an option to simply withdraw and say, we, we, we don't want to trade, we don't want to engage. We have to figure out a way to help write the rules that will allow Americans to play a role in the Asia Pacific region and in the world going forward. And I will tell you that the uh, challenge and the competition that we will face from China going forward is enormous. We can work together on a number of issues like climate change, like the situation in Iran, but fundamentally we are in a competitive relationship in which China does want to write the rules for the 21st century, and we have to get in the game. So Mr. Chairman, I'll stop there. I realize that this is a deeply 
challenging issue from the Democratic Party. I'm very committed to find ways that we can make our commitment to workers and businesses in the United States in a manner that still allows us to lead on the global stage. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Sellison. Sir, thank you for your presentation. Uh, you're right, we do need to compete in Asia. We do compete in Asia. And uh, my question is, you know, why, why, do, why do you, why does the TPP insist on the IDS, I, ISDS, the in, in investor state uh, system that it insists upon now? If you guys say it's urgent as it is, why do you make this uh, international dispute resolution system a core part of the agreement? You say you want it. Mm -hmm. All of us are okay with trade, but then you say, but it has to happen to have this, uh, this investor state dispute resolution system that undermines American sovereignty. If you're so committed to it, why don't you negotiate on that? Oh, why, what else? What about these extended patent protection on medicine? Why do you have to have that if we've got to be in Asia so badly? It's, it's not trade. I mean, I, I will confess that I'm a little resentful when I hear people say that, oh, you guys are against trade. We're, there's trade. There is trade. There's trade now. Yeah. The question is, what are the terms of trade? And the terms of trade that we've seen so far are bad for American workers. Can we get a trade bill that's going to actually enhance the, the American middle class? Or do the, or because I, what I hear you saying, and you may not be saying this, and I'd like you to clarify, is that we may have to just live with some, I don't know, some trade promote some some trade adjustment uh, money that that's that's what we get and we know that multinationals are going to make out big time and you know we're doing a trade deal we're going to have Malaysia in a trade deal when they're the world's leading human trafficker that's slavery shrimp slaves out there you know and I mean in Vietnam the Viet the, I mean the fact is um, it's the terms of trade not trade no problem with being active around the world. I, I think the United States has to be involved in the world, but why do these terms have to be in this deal if you, if you say that we have to? Um, first of all, I thank you for the, uh, thank you for the questions. I am fully with you that the particulars and the specifics of a trade agreement matter. I think Secretary Clinton and uh, Senator Sanders both have made powerful arguments about issues that have to be amended. Now, personally, I was not involved in the negotiation of the trade agreement. And I think these are issues that are before our nation now, and they have to be addressed. And there are a number of issues that, frankly, have been raised by both Democrats and Republicans about this trade agreement that I think that the President and those that are contending uh, for leadership have to recognize are in play in such a way that would probably prevent it from passage by both Republicans and Democrats in the United States. So I think we have to recognize this and at the same time understand that there are also aspects of this trade agreement that probably will support American, uh, uh, American exports and support for jobs in the United States. Um, uh, I'd like to simply say on balance, my view is to try to work it out, uh, find ways uh, that this can either be uh, amended or adjusted uh, in a manner that can be supported by both re Republicans and Democrats going forward. But I will say every issue that you have raised, uh, both uh, uh, Senator uh, Sanders and Secretary Clinton have raised uh, clear objections and they've raised them to the White House as well. So as a person that really comes from the foreign policy community, it's not up to me to negotiate these agreements. That's done elsewhere. And the, the circumstances are worrisome for many of the people uh, that would be affected generally with respect to a loss of sovereignty on negotiations and the like. So I'm not going to stand here and defend those issues. What I'm trying to suggest here is that we cannot walk away from this. We have to figure out a way. Is there a way we can adjust it? Is there a way that we can work with other partners to uh, find a way forward for the simple reason that we just cannot afford to withdraw from this critical region? Jones. Uh, thank you very much. I, I just want to make it clear. Uh, I, I don't think uh, that we can amend uh, or tinker around the edges 
uh, with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, I think that we need to kill it. Uh, it's, uh, it, I think it would be an absolute uh, disaster uh, for our, our economy uh, and for millions of American workers. Uh, you're talking about uh, China writing the rules. Well, I think China's already writing the rules. Uh, before permanent normal trade relations with China, uh, we had about an $83 billion trade deficit with China. Uh, today, uh, the last time I checked, it was over $350 billion a year. Uh, so uh, my, my question to you is, uh, the minimum wage in uh, Vietnam, uh, according to the last statistic I looked at, uh, was about 65 cents an hour. Uh, do you think it's fair uh, to ask American workers who are making $15, $20 an hour uh, manufacturing goods in the United States to have to compete uh, with workers in Vietnam that are paid 65 cents an hour uh, who uh, could get thrown in jail for standing up for their political and uh, economic rights? Uh, as you can imagine, I would, sir, I would probably just respectfully agree generally with the, with the overall proposition. I will say that there are aspects uh, of TPP that, uh, that I think we need to look to the negotiators and commend, um, particularly if TPP is successful and Vietnam is a signatory, it will bring unionization to Vietnam in a way that they've never had in the past. And I recognize, I recognize that, that that's a small comfort, generally speaking, for American workers. But ultimately, I think what we want is to create standards that raise environmental uh, uh, and labor productivity uh, in a way that American workers can compete directly. Um, and I would just respectfully say, ultimately, the trajectory of what's happening in Asia uh, is going on with or without our direct involvement. The rise of uh, productivity and engagement there is profound and deep. And I would simply say that the United States has to do what it can to harness it when and where we can. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Barker. Yes, we, we heard from our last speaker on the type of devastation that the bad, bad tree excuse me, bad trade, trade agreements. Um, many enacted with the support of Democrats. Um, what are we going to do to ensure that our party stands unequivocally unified um, to totally redefine our trade policies to the ones that represent the interest of American workers and not corporations? Look, you know, um, I spend an enormous amount of time traveling abroad, and generally speaking, there is deep anxiety about what they see with the respect to the conduct of our election season, right? They're worried about what it means uh, for the world, how do we think about our, um, uh, our general goals going forward. I would say one of the positive things that has taken place is that there is a growing view in both parties, re, re, uh, Democrats and Republicans, that if we are to trade and engage on the global stage, we have to do it better, and that we have to recognize that globalization and trade has had a devastating impact over the last generation on American workers, and that we cannot simply conduct ourselves as we have done in the past. And so what I try to po point to friends uh, who say, oh my God, look at what's happening inside your country, is that that is a uh, recognition that is understood both in Republican and Democratic circles, particularly in Democratic circles, but as importantly in the current period, much more questions now, even in communities in the past, that accepted just quote, quote, free trade without any caveats or conditions. Uh, I think that anyone who is elected, hopefully from my perspective, Secretary Clinton, there is a recognition that if the United States is to undertake these kinds of agreements, that at the top of the list has to be a recognition that of course we want to engage internationally, of course we want to see what we can do to advance our own interests. My own particular view would be that the only way in which we can recreate and build jobs for the 21st century is to export more. And I think we're going to need as a nation to export more. Most of the global customers exist 
outside of American borders. And we've got to be able to take advantage of that going forward. We've never needed to export before, and now we do. And any agreement has to create a level playing field for the United States to be able to, uh, to uh, export our goods and services to a rising middle class, most of whom live in Asia. So my sense is that this election campaign has been very powerful and important, and it's imprinted on both political parties that we cannot do business as usual going forward. And I would simply say I accept that completely. I would simply want us not to withdraw from this challenge, but to try to meet both challenges, that we have to lead, we have to try to write the rules, we, try, we have to try to engage, and at the same time, we have to respect the profound nature of protecting our jobs and opportunities inside the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.